welcome to another episode of Ghost Emoji with uh, me, Taylor, and my, my best good friend, Becca. Hi. Today, we are going to be talking about the much-anticipated episode on ball lightning. Ball lightning. I'm really excited about it. I was trying to explain to someone what I thought we were going to do on our next episode, and they were like, what? And I was like, ball lightning. And you're like, I don't... Are you saying... Is that a joke? Ball lightning? <laughs> yeah, like, are the... did you mean to put those two words together? Because <laughs> I don't intuitively know what that means when you say ball lightning. God, it's <laughs> unexplained, natural, occurring phenomena. Jesus. I know. I guess to be fair, before you showed me that video on Tumblr, I... I had never heard of this before, and I consider myself pretty well read on like, like a like a general amount of like paranormal or weird natural phenomena, and I I had never seen it or heard of it. But then after I saw it, it's all I could think about. People would be talking to me, and they think that I'm listening to them, but I'm actually thinking about ball lightning <laughs> inside my head. <laughs> what can I say? I'm real good at the internet. I know. It was so good. Mm -hmm. We'll have to, I guess, link to it or something, because we'll, I mean, obviously we're going to talk a lot about ball lightning and how weird and amazing it is, but until, like, you see it, which is, there's not that many videos of it, there's a handful, but for as often as it happens, it's kind of hard to catch on video, because it, you, it's really difficult to predict when it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Do you want to describe kind of the video you sent me and how beautiful it was and how my life was changed forever? <laughs> Basically, uh, the video is some person like recording, I think like they're from their porch. It's raining or storming and off in the distance you can see through the trees this big huge ball of, or not even ball, it's just this big giant glowing like blue like turquoise blue thing that's just moving straight through the air and you're seeing it like interspersed through the trees so it just looks so bizarre like you're looking at it and I can't imagine seeing it in real life and not like either having like heart palpitations or possibly fainting just because it's so weird because like if it was moving around sporadically I think it would be less eerie but the fact that it moves in like a straight line is just super weird it's super weird it doesn't move like really fast Mm -mm. it just kind of like slowly glides through and i think part of it being behind the trees like you said kind of made it more i mean i don't know if i could have looked on it like just full in the face Mm -mm. i don't know how the person taking the video didn't like exclaim or do anything i mean they just kind of like follow it for a second and then that's the end of it I would have thrown my phone on the ground and, like, (laughs) ran back into my house. Because it does, I mean, it was bright blue. It's making this really loud, like, crackling noise. Like, a mad scientist, like, laboratory kind of thing. Like, I've I've never seen anything like it. And then when we started, you know, looking up stuff on it, the fact that it's been around for a long time and people have, have, you know, been discussing it, but only, like, in the past... 50 to 60 years been doing like intensive study on it Mm -hmm. like just my brain blew my mind (laughs) blew my mind but so we'll link to that video so uh, i if you're not impressed by it i don't understand it's honestly like (laughs) explaining it doesn't even do it justice because you see it and you're like what the hell what the hell because it's huge it's not like it's a tiny thing it's like i don't even know how big it i can't I'm not good at estimation, but it was big. Well, and that's where I got, like, when we were kind of going back through, we're going to talk about sort of, like, the folklore, like, much older occurrences that we've heard about it, and then kind of go up to to modern day, because it's one of those things where I imagine if you saw it, like, in medieval times, you definitely would have thought it was, like, an angel or a demon or or something and, like, freaked out, but... From what I read, a lot of the times, I guess it happened so commonly that people just kind of 
didn't ignore them, but they treated them like they were like a nuisance more than anything else. And I was just like, but, uh, but it's a glowing ball of light. I don't know. Like, I saw it and I immediately was like, oh my god, it's real life biotics from Mass Effect. And <laughs> I can't imagine, like, without having the context of, like, lightning and, or not even lightning, but, like, without having the understanding of, like, lightning and electricity and things like that, not being either frightened or in awe of it. So the fact that it's been occurring since... I mean, forever, I guess, but there's been, like, documentation of it since before electricity. I don't know. I just, you'd think that they'd be a little more freaked out by it or interested in it. There's a passage from this one book that had a lot of info on it called The Atomic West, Um, and they had one passage that talked about how much ball lightning folklore, however, reduced the sphere of energy to a category of nuisance. A 19th century French peasant girl had one rise up her skirt and exit her collar, terrifying her, but doing no physical harm. A 1945 English Midlands uh, housewife brushed one away involuntarily only to discover it had cinched her dress and caused temporary numbness in her legs. Uh, Rocky Mountain forest lookouts allegedly included high stools so that rangers could perch on them while ball lightning danced around their feet. And I'm just like, the fact that they have, like, these contingency plans for, like, oh, that's just the, you know, light balls again. No big deal. <laughs> and then there's kind of, like, varying accounts of it. Like, some talk about how, like, it does, it doesn't hurt you or do anything. Some talk about how, like, they just kind of, like, float or hover and they'll go, like, through walls. Some say they bounce off stuff. And then other things talk about when they disappear, they either kind of disappear with a poof and that's it. And then some talk about how when they dissipate that they, like, explode and can actually cause harm or damage. So there's a lot of varying accounts, which I guess kind of lends to the fact that for something that's as amazing as this is, like, we just don't, we don't understand that much about it. And it's really hard to observe because it does happen sporadically. And so if you don't have someone there to take, like, a a very... I don't know, I guess, like, scientific look at it and not just be like, oh, that's the thing again. Yeah. Another thing is it comes in a bunch of different colors, apparently. Like, there are a lot of different um, accounts of the color. Like, the one we saw, it looked blue. And then um, there's apparently accounts of it coming in, I think, red, orange, and yellow is the most common. Um, But a wide range of colors have been observed, which makes me wonder if maybe it has something to do with, like, what elements are in the air or what the altitude is or things like that or just I don't know I guess I would I would think it would have to be related to the chemistry of like the air or the ground or something that would change the color and possibly maybe the potency or like the uh, chance of it being harmful or exploding that's my guess yeah the two theories that I ran into the most talked about how um, because usually you will see them during a lightning storm when there's other lightning going on and if lightning strikes the ground and it has like a high silicon content then it forms like a vapor that then like comes up and becomes electrified and so I think that probably would have something to do with that but the other one I read something said something about like it becoming like a plasma ball like something about like radioactive like it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff and it all sounds very smart but all of them kind of come back being like ah i mean it could be this we don't know it's all speculation <laughs> and they've tried to recreate it in labs the one guy who excerpt that i was reading from um was talking about a guy named james tuck and he was someone who did a lot of research on this but he i guess at one point was trying to see if he could do an experiment in a submarine because something about like their batteries like they would occur inside submarines huh. underwater <laughs> weird so i think the military at first was like uh, absolutely not no that sounds dangerous no no but i also it was another one of those stories where we were like yeah you know people talk about it and talk about how these you know, balls would, like, float around and people... Let me see. Submariner folklore contained a number of ball lightning stories. When enlisted men threw the wrong switches on their diesel electric generators, they occasionally caused fireballs to dance around their legs. Which, I'm just like, okay, don't do that. (laughs) That sounds 
I mean, I don't think they did it on purpose, but yeah, no. the fact that they just were like, this just happens. No big deal. While submarine officers scoffed at such tales, they were never present when the malfunction occurred. German, American, and British submariners had all witnessed the same thing. Using this as his guide, Tuck approached the U.S. Navy, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, no, we're switching out diesel subs for nuclear subs, so they could not be bothered. And I guess that came to an end. But someone, maybe him, did it later on, and they were able to kind of recreate something similar. There was a another man who tried to basically recreate what Benjamin Franklin had done, and he was trying to attract ball lightning. So in um, August of 1753, progr- August of 1753, Professor George Richmond of St. Petersburg, tried with a colleague, Mr. Sokolaw, to attract it by attaching a wire to the top of his house, and he let it down to an iron bar suspended above, in quotations, the electrical needle, whatever that means, and a bowl of water partly filled with iron fillings. Apparently, this was published in the Pennsylvania Gazette, uh, judging from the needle that the tempest was at a great distance, assured Mr. Sokolaw that there was no danger, but there might be at the approach. Um, Mr. Richmond stood about a foot from the bar, attentively observing the needle. Soon after Mr. Sokolaw saw the machine begin- being untouched, a globe of blue and whitish fire about four inches diameter dart from the bar against Mr. Richmond's forehead, who fell backwards without the least outcry. This was succeeded by an explosion like that of a small cannon, which also threw Mr. Sokolaw on the floor feeling, as it were, some blows on his back. It has since been found that the wire breaking some bits had hit him behind and left the marks of burning on his clothes. Apparently, Professor Richmond was killed and his body being found in the midst of his apparatus, like an artilleryman dead under the wreck of his gun. So that didn't go so great for him <laughs> at all. No. Well, that's where I couldn't tell if he was just trying to attract lightning and then didn't account for getting ball lightninged in the forehead. I don't know. Man, I'm glad he had someone else with him to observe him being hit in the head with a ball of ball lightning. Because <laughs> otherwise, I assume they just would have been like, oh, lightning struck his apparatus and it blew up and it killed him. Yep. So sad. So sad. That's one of the few ones where they talk about it actually, like, killing someone. Because for the most part, it's supposed to just kind of, like, pass through whatever and sort of, like, if you touch it, it'll kind of, like zing you a little bit but not kill you mr richmond it must have been because he was trying to like conduct it rather than just i guess interacting with it i don't know you'd think that more people would get hurt if it's raining outside and it touches them but maybe it has to have metal for it to i don't know that's weird it's just like that's the weird thing about it is i feel like everything is so inconsistent phenomena who knows? <laughs> one of the other ones, it said, uh, perhaps one of the most famous ball lightning sightings was by a young Tsar Nicholas, grandson to Tsar Alexander II, who witnessed a flaming orb during a church service in the 19th century. And I'm just going to read off his account, and hopefully I won't stumble over it too much, because sometimes they have this this ye old English. They have a very strange cadence, yes. Capitalized weird. <laughs> like in the one you were just reading where it said the marks of burning on his clothes. Yeah, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Instead of just his clothes, they were burned. The marks of burning. What the heck? Uh, Once my parents were away and I was at the all-night vigil with my grandfather in the small church in Alexandria. During the service, there was a powerful thunderstorm. Streaks of lightning flashed one after the other, and it seemed as if the peals of thunder would shake even the church and the whole world to its foundations. Suddenly, it became quite dark. A blast of wind from the open door blew out the flame of the candles which were lit in front of the iconostasis. There was a long clap of thunder, louder than before, and I suddenly saw a fiery ball flying from the window straight towards the head of the emperor. The ball, it was of lightning, which, ball lightning, Yep. (laughs) whirled around the floor, then passed the chandelier and flew out the door into the park. My heart froze. I glanced at my grandfather. His face was completely calm. Did he not see it? (laughs) <laughs> like what i wasn't paying attention <laughs> uh he crossed himself just as calmly as he had when the fiery ball had flown near us and i felt that it was unseemly and not courageous to be frightened as i was no that's fine you can be a uh, scared <laughs> yeah a ball of lightning just flew through the church and out the door you're fine oh my god 
I hope what? that the reason that nobody talks about it is just toxic masculinity. People are like, I ain't scared. It's no big deal. It just zapped me a little. <laughs> I feel like then they would talk about it, but they'd be like, I'm not scared of it. It's not a big deal. Who cares? Yeah, I got hit in the head with a giant ball of lightning. Who cares? Haven't you gotten hit in the head with a ball of lightning? It's no big deal. No need to cry about it. God. Especially this kid. He's like little. He's a little kid. Uh, where was I? Uh, I felt that one had only to look at what was happening and believe in the mercy of God as he, my grandfather, did. After the ball had passed through the whole church and suddenly gone out through the door, I again looked at my grandfather. A faint smile was on his face. Uh. <laughs> he nodded his head at me. My panic disappeared, and from that time I had no more fear of storms. Oh, that's creepy but okay i mean it's not so much the storm it's the fact that a giant glowing ball of lightning was like bouncing around that's not gonna happen in every storm this was a special one are we overreacting maybe because i mean I, i've mentioned it to some other people and they're kind of like okay all right no it's weird y'all it's weird if you don't think it's weird are you an alien are you a lizard person <laughs> Is that just common where you live? Do you just have ball lightning in your house and you're like, oh, no big deal. Those are just the ball lightnings. Sometimes baby Ellie plays with them. Mm. Sometimes we eat them with our breakfast. It's no big deal. Oh, like, God. I just want to understand. <laughs> you're all lizard people. Fine. Uh, start your morning with a ball, a bowl of ball lightning. A hearty bowl of ball lightning. That's how you get all your vitamins. <laughs> So there have been a couple. It seems like, you know, people generally seem to take them either as a nuisance and kind of like ignore them or talk about, you know, how it was like a sign from God or some kind of like celestial intervention, especially if it was in a church. Uh, yeah. Not, not much looking into it to see what happened. I mean, I guess like if you didn't have much interest in science, like maybe you just didn't have the foresight to be like how did that happen oh well <laughs> oh well <laughs> i'm only gonna live till i'm like 25 who gives a shit i've never brushed my teeth <laughs> like ever <laughs> Ooh, yuck but now people have done a little bit of research and what we have managed to find out is a bulleted list of the the general what's the word not specifications these are the facts. Yeah, these are rock facts. <laughs> it's a rock fact. It's a ball lightning fact. I know, mean, it's a, a review of the available literature published in 1972 identified the properties of a typical ball lightning whilst cautioning against over-reliance on eyewitness accounts, even though those are the most important. Let's be real. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, is it my turn? I don't know, so we could read like every other one. We can do whatever we want. It's our podcast. All right. They frequently appear almost simultaneously with cloud-to-ground lightning discharge. Um, they are generally spherical or pear-shaped with fuzzy edges. Their diameters range from 1 to 100 centimeters, um, which is 0.39 to 39.37 inches, and are most commonly 10 to 20 centimeters, which is almost 4 inches to uh, almost 8 inches. Their brightness corresponds to roughly that of a domestic lamp, so they can be seen clearly in the daylight. Uh, a wide range of colors has been observed, red, orange, and yellow being the most common. Oh, so was that one, the, the blue one, was that a special one? I guess so. It's I, th I don't think it's as common, but it's weird because that's the same color that, um, what, Richmond got killed by? Mm-hmm. So, mm, I wonder if there's just similar... Makeups? Yeah, similar makeups. Blue's my favorite. Me too. Sorry, Richmond. It's the coolest. Sorry about ya. Um, okay. The lifetime of each event is from one second to over a minute, with the brightness remaining fairly constant during that time, which that was true of the, the one that I saw in the video. Mm hmm And they tend to move most often in a horizontal direction at a few meters per second, but may also move vertically, remain stationary, or wander erratically. Many are described as having rotational motion. Uh, it is rare that observers report the sensation of heat, although in some cases the disappearance of the ball is accompanied by the liberation of heat. Ooh. Liberate me. <laughs> 
Some display an affinity for metal objects and may move along conductors such as wire or metal fences. Ah, Richmond. Which I... S- <laughs> oh, no. I saw that one when I was looking up more videos where it was like a ball traveling along like telephone wires and stuff like that. Ooh. Which didn't look like much fun. But it didn't seem like it was hurting the wires. Like, the transformers and stuff weren't, like, blowing up with it as it traveled. But it did look weird. Some appear within buildings, passing through closed doors and windows. You can't keep them out. (laughs) Don't bother locking your doors. No. They go where they want. Mm Mm-hmm. Some have appeared within metal aircraft and have entered and left without causing damage, except to my heart and my brain. Because if I saw that, I would lose my shit absolutely Mm -hmm. and die, Mm -hmm. like, immediately. Please don't ever let me see, like, I would love to see a ball lightning, except if I'm on a goddamn airplane. Please do not ever come for me on an airplane ball lightning, I'm begging you. She would die. Oh, God. Like, we have a lot of stories about that, and I just, I can't, I can't. (laughs) I think that would be just, like, an information overload for you. You're already too stressed in a plane, and then having that happen, I feel like you would just short out. Mm-hmm. Yep. My, my brain would be done. Whew. Uh, the disappearance of a ball is generally rapid and may be either silent or explosive. So, one or the other, I guess. Um, odors resembling ozone, burning sulfur, or nitrogen oxides are often reported. Which, that one, I when I was reading the one about... Uh, them being made from, like, plasma that wraps around, like, radioactive particles or something. Mm -hmm. They said that that also attributed to the bad smell. Oh, weird. But I don't actually know if I know... I know what ozone smells like. I know what sulfur smells like. I don't know if I know what nitrogen oxide smells like off the top of my head. Yeah. It makes me wonder if people have mistaken them for, um, like, specters or ghosts, since a lot of the time, like, sulfur, the smell of sulfur is associated with spirits Demons? or <laughs> yeah that too um <laughs> so it makes me wonder if people maybe who don't know what that ball lightning is a thing are like oh, it's a spirit it's satan it's satan himself all that sulfur man mm-hmm. and then the last one we have just kind of like a general roundup is they bounce off walls float through and leave holes make up your mind exclamation point it's a good way to close on the facts yeah, that one was actually added by me. I figured. <laughs> it wasn't included, and I was just like, I can't keep it straight. Whether they can go through stuff, or they're blowing everything up. Mm. I don't know, man. I just don't know. Ball lightning. <clears throat> well, do you want to talk about uh, Sinomo's fire? And how it's not ball lightning? Sure. So, there's also another natural occurring phenomenon that is called St. Elmo's Fire. No, not the movie or the bar. (laughs) It is an actual, like, weather phenomenon in which luminous plasma is created by a coronal discharge from a sharp or pointed object in a strong electrical field in the atmosphere, um, such as those generated by thunderstorms or created by a volcanic eruption. A lot of people have thought it was ball lightning or people, like, try to interchange, I guess, them, but they're they're very different. Ball lightning is actual lightning, whereas St. Elmo's fire is plasma. And I don't know if it's they get them, like, confused since they, they do look very different, mm-hmm. but if they just thought it was maybe caused by... The same thing. St. Elmo's fire is named after St. Erasmus of Formia, also called St. Elmo. One of the two Italian names for St. Erasmus, the other being St. Erasmo. Mm. That's a lot of names. Uh, he's the patron saint of sailors. Uh, the phenomenon sometimes appeared on ships at sea during thunderstorms and was regarded by religious or sailors with religious awe for its glowing ball of light. Oh, so I guess it can appear as a ball and not just like a like a pointed kind of like extension of light coming off of it. Yeah, because I read I read uh, a couple of people being like, oh, you know. People get those confused, but they're two different phenomena, so, mm. Well, color me, uh, something. <laughs> uh, I guess at least it's considered a good sign. I feel like anytime something like that happens, people are like, that's it, we're dead. Get ready. It's Satan. It's Satan! <laughs> now, I also read uh, somewhere else where, like, you could even get 
St. Elmo's fire from, like, um, Roman soldiers, like, would have it, like, coming off of their spear. Oh, God. I know. I don't know if they had, you know, patron saints, because I know that's more of, like, a Catholic thing, but it was a cool visual. I imagine they were like, sick, dude, look at my spear. (laughs) Exactly. Word for word. Yep. I was there. I'm immortal. Nice. It's the people you never expect. Keanu Reeves, me. <laughs> Who else? I don't know. It's. I mean, we don't all know each other. I know. It's raining outside right now. I was driving home the other day and it was raining really hard and lightning uh, hit, like, a tree kind of, like, behind me in my rear view and I was... Now every time, like, I see lightning strike the ground, I'm just like, this is it. This is my, my time to shine. I'm gonna get to see ball lightning. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Because I really want to see it now in person, because, like, it's not that uncommon. It's just really hard to capture, and I want it real bad. I want to see all the cool stuff, and I never get to see it. It's like, at work, we have a, a, we have a ghost, I'm using quotation marks, in our office, and almost everyone else, like, believes in it, but I've never seen it or heard it. Or whatever. Like, we live in a, or work in a mixed-use building, so a lot of the time it's, you know, you hear bangings and people flushing toilets or doing whatever. The other day we came back from lunch and my friend Sheree strummed, there was a, we have a guitar mounted on the wall because our, we work with, like, radio stations and stuff. It was a signed guitar. And she strummed it and then stopped. And I went into the office kitchen to put my leftovers up and then I heard a really loud strum and I heard her and Andy freaking out, and I came out, and they were like, the guitar strummed on its own. Can you believe it? And I was like, no, I didn't. I literally turned around for one second. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and they're just like, oh, it was, oh, I can't even believe it. That's what they both sound like. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even believe it. I can't even believe it. Uh, and we spent forever just trying to see, like, if Sheree's ponytail had hit it when she, like, turned her head. You know, we, we did everything and we couldn't recreate it. So they were all like, I can't believe that's like the most pure proof that the ghost is real I've ever seen. And I'm just like, would have been cool to see it considering I was standing five feet away from it. I just happened to have my head in a fridge. He knows you're looking for him. He's not going to let you see him. Ugh. Every time I walk by that guitar, I'm like, Broom. what you doing, ghost? What's up? <laughs> Want to play me a song? Yeah, we were joking about that. We were like, man, what if it starts like, playing the guitar. It's like, anyway, here's Wonderwall. <laughs> God, I hope so. It's a really out-of-tune guitar. I really hope it doesn't decide to play it. Oh. Which won't happen, because I, I I, still just think that, I don't know, that, like, the string hit the fret or something like that. I don't know. We've gotten way off topic, but I just, I want to see stuff, and the ghosties won't let me see it. So, come at me, ghosties. Go to her. I don't want it. <laughs> Becca's like, no, thank you. Mm-mm. So, back on topic. Ball lightning. Kind of talking about St. Elmo's fire and sailors and soldiers and stuff like that. One thing that came up when I was looking through this stuff was about Foo Fighters in World War II. Pilots uh, would be flying and they described seeing these balls of light. They seem to almost be like engaging with the plane like flying with them one of the things that makes me think it might not have been ball lightning is it didn't seem like they were always happening during a storm and it seemed like they moved quite a lot like zigzagging and moving around which i know that ball lightning can do but these seem like they were moving uh, quite a lot makes me wonder if like higher up altitudes make it move more maybe since in airplanes it's supposed to bounce around but a lot of the accounts of on the ground it's sort of stable it doesn't bounce a whole lot more sluggish Mm -hmm. but these balls of lightning i guess people american soldiers thought that it was like the germans coming up with some sort of secret weapon um possibly the japanese and so i think that's kind of also what inspired a lot of the fear that went with it is because they were moving so fast that they were just like there's no way like these have to be controlled by someone you know of course they don't have cameras or anything so we don't have any photos or or anything like that but then afterwards the germans and the japanese both reported having seen similar things 
So that kind of disputed the idea that they were created by the Germans. Except for, I was reading a thing about German secret weapons in World War II, and there was a guy named Rudolf Lussar, who had been a major in a German army technical unit, and he wrote a book where he talked about, uh, it had a chapter called Wonder Weapons, and in the chapter on that he claimed that they had developed small automated unconventional aircraft um, one version of it was called the Fuhrball, which I'm guessing would mean like fireball, while the other referred to as the Kugelblitz. Um, according to the story, these craft were automatically guided and jet propelled, and they were supposed to use electrostatic discharges as like that they carried within them to interfere with electrical systems on the bomber's engine. But people who had run into these Foo Fighters, which I feel kind of weird using the term because... Part of what I read said it might have also been kind of like a derogatory term for Japanese pilots. Ooh. But I haven't seen that widely wherever, but just putting that out there that I read that. Ooh. I'm probably just trying to use it as a technical name for this. But they said that people who had seen them, um, they didn't have like issues like that with their planes. So if that's what they were, it didn't work. <laughs> We developed this really cool thing that does this really specific, neat thing, but it actually doesn't work. So they basically just make drones. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> drones that don't do anything. So, but they had that, and so then they kind of fell back on, they're like, well, you know, what if they're UFOs in, like, an alien sense? Not in the fact that they literally are just unidentified flying objects that could be of, like, human origin. Um, the military decided that they might be an unusual electric or optical effect related to ball lightning or St. Elmo's fire. St. Elmo's fire is known to form as an electrical glow around the wingtips of planes, um, but it doesn't usually form into the shape of a, sp a sphere. And ball lightning is spherical and has been observed near aircraft, but it's usually short-lived and it doesn't really fly in formation with the planes. Mm -hmm. So that was just kind of a little aside on it where... That could be one of the explanations for that, if you've ever heard of that phenomenon in World War II. Just trying to make it accessible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the most bizarre part about ball lightning is that like people were skeptical about it actually being real until the 60s. It just seems so bizarre that it took until like 60 years ago for people to be like, no, that's real. It happens. Yeah, I was going to say, just especially since it's not like people were being like, it's aliens. Yeah. They were just like, no, it's it's like a lightning, but it's in a ball. And they're just like, get out of here. You're drunk. <laughs> it's clearly a sign from God. <laughs> Duh. I just, I mean, there's all sorts of weird lightning. Why couldn't it form into a ball and be bad? Badly behaved balls. Well, Taylor, the earth is flat, so... <laughs> and hollow. Oh, also hollow. It's flat and hollow. Oh, here's another one where it's in a plane. Uh, Secretary of State Dean Acheson described one that entered President Harry Truman's plane during a storm. Um, Nature periodically carries articles on ball lightning, and a number of scientists put forth their opinions. Um, in spite of scores of sightings, even a few modest research programs by 1969... No one had been able to photograph ball lightning or duplicate it under laboratory conditions. Consequently, all ball lightning evidence retained a non-scientific dimension, which I thought was kind of strange. At the most extreme, it was regarded like UFO sightings, with every photograph under suspicion of possible fraud. Even Tuck admitted that ball lightning had provided the graveyard for many a scientific reputation. Which, again, I just don't understand why people treated it like it was like this big weird thing because you're not saying it's aliens you're being like it's science it's a weather thing and i want to recreate it nevertheless from the late 1960s tuck threw himself into the subject with his usual intensity um during early 1969 he and a few colleagues began devoting lunch hours twice a week to ball lightning research dang oh man they really wanted a photo they said that they uh Working with Robert Gordon of the photographic section of Los Alamos, set up two 16mm cameras in front of several million dollars worth of batteries and deliberately caused short circuits. Um, these experiments produced a great deal of noise and some gigantic electrical discharges, but nothing looked even remotely like ball lightning. Uh, so in 1973, Tuck's experiments came to an abrupt halt. That year, a new Los Alamos lab director commandeered their space and equipment for his pet chemical laser project. Hmm. 
Oh, I guess after that was when he wanted to try the submarine thing, and that didn't really come through. That's a bummer. I know. Someone must be like, I'll be taking this equipment. I need to make a laser. It's very important. Bye. Well, I guess a laser probably does have more, like, useful whatever, as opposed to, I know what ball lightning is. <laughs> I know what ball lightning is. My dad said I can make ball lightning. My house has a front door and a back door. But, yeah, so apparently, like, in the 60s, like Becca said, they kind of started to get their act together. Especially, um, I think it was in 1963, there was a group of scientists flying from New York to Washington, D.C., and they witnessed a blazing orb drift down the aisle and disappear through the rear of the plane. And I guess because it was full of scientists, they were just like, huh. <laughs> well, how about that? Thanks, Ball Lightning. Ugh. But one of the one of the people on the plane was R. C. Jennison, um, who was in the plane, and he was one of the people that saw. He described um, his own observation of ball lightning. I was seated near the front of the passenger cabin of an all metal airliner um, on a late night flight from New York to Washington. The aircraft encountered an electrical storm, during which it was enveloped in a sudden bright and loud electrical discharge. Um, I guess this was on March nineteenth, nineteen sixty three. Um, some seconds after this, a glowing sphere a little more than 20 centimeters in diameter emerged from the pilot's cabin and passed down the aisle of the aircraft approximately 50 centimeters from me, maintaining the same height and course for the whole distance over which it could be observed. And I guess after that, they were like, hmm, I guess we should start compiling stuff mm -hmm. and listening to people who have been trying to do research on this, like that, you know, Tuck guy. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who's been talking to us and trying to get us to pay some attention to it. People just don't want to listen, man. Frustrating. James Tuck. He was the one I was so happy I found that book where he talks about it a lot. It was it was way more than we would probably be able to cover in an entire episode, so grab some of the main stuff from it. But he was, he was actually uh, one of the people who was involved in... Um, is it the Manhattan Project? Is that the name? When they were working on the atomic bomb? I think so. Um, but he was involved in that. So he was he was a very, very smart guy. He was well known for starting the Project Sherwood Group at Los Angeles Scientific Laboratory in 1952. He wanted to study and develop concepts for controlled fusion energy. And in his later year, years, he was mainly interested in the topic of ball lightning. He traveled widely, giving lectures on both observation of others... Um, his own experimental efforts. He collected anecdotal observations obtained from those in lecture audiences, and he would actually send out newspaper articles telling people to like call his office and give them their accounts of seeing it. And he eventually had to cut this off because his office and like his secretary was just being overwhelmed by people who would call in and be like, "Yeah, I've seen this. Here's my story," which just goes to show how. You know, how widespread and common it is. It's thundering. I hear it. Ooh, some Atmo. See how the noise cancellation likes that. <laughs> when we're editing. Tuck's primary publication on ball lightning was a short laboratory report in 1971. Um, he wanted to publish a book on the subject, but unfortunately he passed away before he could get that published, which I thought was kind of sad because he did a lot of work. And I guess maybe people just don't, like, they're not as interested in it because even as often as it appears to be showing up in planes and stuff, it doesn't seem like it's taking planes down and it doesn't cause, like, significant damage. So I think it would, it's mainly just, like, a pure curiosity type thing. So maybe that's why there's not that much research done in it. Probably. He did so much work on it. Mm -hmm. That is sad that he never got to see, like, all of that hard work come to fruition. I know, but... Ball lightning. Ball lightning, man. Oh, man, there's one little bit I had forgotten from when we were talking about the folklore. Folklore? The folklore. The folklore. <laughs> Get your folklore on the ball lightning, y'all. Uh, there was one medieval scientist that suggested ball lightning occurred when a spark struck a devil who became so enraged he forgot himself and turned momentarily visible. Oh, I thought you were going to say and he pooped himself. And that's <laughs> what the ball lightning is. <laughs> I mean, this is a medieval scientist, so you can pretty much just say 
Whatever. Well, if it had been Ben Ben Franklin, was he the one that thought poop was funny? I know Mozart did. Mozart thought poop jokes and fart jokes were funny. If Mozart saw it, he would have said it was poop. I feel like Benjamin Franklin was the one who, like, every morning would, like, stand naked on his balcony. But that could be made up. No, I think that's true. Didn't he have orgies, too? I don't know. Most of what I know about Benjamin Franklin, I know from that episode of The Office when they get a Benjamin Franklin impersonator instead of a stripper for oh, Phyllis's yeah. bachelorette yeah. party. Good. Good times. Yeah. That is a excellent source. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the Scranton Historical Society. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ball lightning is really cool, and I would really like to see it. I probably never will, because I'm not Lucky Pierre, it's fine. Maybe Becca will see it. You can live vicariously through my experience. I doubt I'll ever see it either. Have you seen it? Has anyone seen it out there? Anyone listening? It's supposed to be really, really common. So if you have seen it, uh, if you have like a video or a picture, just send us anything. I just, I just want to know. I just want to see as much of it as I can. Yeah, no more poopy YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. Just just tell me you saw it. I'll believe you. Yep. Well, that's all we have on ball lightning, even though I'm going to continue to think about it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just ponder its nature. Just ruminate on its existence and the fact that people in the 18 to 1900s were not impressed by it. Damn them. They saw it all the time, and they were just like, no big deal. Come on, Jedediah. (laughs) It was cool. Ball lightning is cool, Dad. Did I tell you that I have a relative? Like, when I looked up all of my Ancestry.com stuff, I have- there's a Jebediah rare somewhere way, way back. Oh. Well, I mean, I don't think you have told me that, but I would not be surprised. Ugh. (laughs) Anyways. (laughs) Thanks again for listening, and we will be back again next Tuesday. Uh, I know me and Becca have some travel plans, not together, unfortunately, but we're both going to be kind of out and about in the next few weeks, so we might try to record some in advance and get those scheduled, but if there's a hiccup, please forgive us. We have lives occasionally, not very often, Mm -mm. but when we do, we gotta gotta go for it. I'm mostly just strapped to the computer all the time doing stupid shit but um well not stupid shit i think it's work but anyways if you enjoyed this episode and what we're doing then please like and subscribe if you're on youtube and uh if you're on podbean or itunes hit that subscribe button review tell a friend yeah tell a friend you know somebody who likes scary movies or spooky stuff be like, hey, I'm listening to this podcast, and it's pretty okay. Do you want to listen to it, too? Then we can talk about how dumb those two girls are. It'll be fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You could also follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Emoji Show. We're on there. Post post all our new episodes. Yeah, on the Twitters. What are we going to talk about next week, you think? I don't know. That was kind of the end of the ones I've done, like, extensive research on. So it's just going to be a wild card next week, I guess. We always like suggestions, so send us stuff in. We're, we're working through a big list of stuff, so don't be sad if it's not the next one that we do, but we have a pile. Mm-hmm. We have a pile of, of subjects to, to go through, so, and I'm excited about each and every one. Yeah. Becca's very excited. <laughs> I'm always excited. So, till next time, stay spooky. Bye. Bye. <laughs>